Hey everyone, welcome to Quick Takes. It's Thursday, March 31st, 2022, and today we are talking about Thinkific and Farmer's Edge make layoffs and executive changes. Pivot to monetizing other people's content leads to a $14.5 million round for Bonsai. Canadian Web3 Council is formed to help shape Canada's approach to Web3. And a quicker take, Athenian raises $27 million. I'll now bring up Alex Norman. Hey, Alex. Hey, how Alex. You? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I can't believe it's the end of the quarter already. I know. I know. Where did the month go? It's crazy. Yeah, and I thought spring was here, but we got cold weather again this week. So. I know. The snow was not uh, welcomed today. I, <laughs> I didn't like to see that. Um, well, despite the cold temperatures still, why don't we jump into uh, the tech news from the week? So why don't we start with um, the Thinkific Farmer's Edge uh, news and the executive changes and layoffs. So maybe we start with what those two have in common. So both these com co oh God, uh, both these companies went public on the TSX in 2021. Um, they are part of this technology IPO boom that happened last year. Both companies were well received. They actually oversubscribed. And they use the proceeds at IPO to continue their fast growth with limited concerns uh, to the bottom line. And if you go back, Farmer's Edge raised $125 million when it went public. Thinkific raised $160 million and had demand for a billion dollars of, of, of shares. Um, unfortunately, like the weather, the market uh, sentiment has cooled and has changed. And now both these companies who are unprofitable um, are their growth at all costs is no longer accepted by the market. And both are about 80% below their IPO price. So maybe you can hit on a little bit about why the market is disappointed in each company. Well, we'll start with Farmer's Edge. I think no matter what the market conditions would are, this would have been poorly, uh, poorly received Q4. Mm -hmm. um, their revenues declined 25% year over year. And what they are is they're a company that makes money by covering acreage of farms and their acreage covered was down 15%. And their operating losses tripled year over year to $16 million. Thinkific, who continued growing, and they grew about 80% year over year, mm -hmm. um, which is the good news. So they, you know, your company that's going public, it's a growth story, and you're growing at the top line. Unfortunately, their bottom line um, was quite high. They lost $36 million, or sorry, $38 million, um, which was oh, sorry the revenue was 38 million dollars and they lost 26 million dollars which compares to million dollars million three lost uh the previous year so they grew by 80 percent mm -hmm. but their losses increased by 20x yeah the losses unfortunately increased too so a two-parter question what actions have they taken and what changed in the market to make them take those actions so farmer's edge their ceo resigned and they arranged a 75 million dollar loan i guess you're burning lots of money you need to get capital to stay afloat yep. Thinkific announced that they're cutting 100 uh, jobs or 20% of their workforce. So what's changed was a year ago when these companies were going public, um, they were being rewarded for top line growth. And when you look at the value of a company, hypothetically, it's the present value of its cash flows. And there's two ways mm -hmm. to get cash flows. Either grow really quickly mm -hmm. and you know improve how much actually goes, actually profit you make. And so a year ago, the market is rewarding people that are going growing quickly, saying, hey, you keep on growing fast, and the bigger that top line number is, whenever you decide to make a profit, that'll be a big bottom line number, and we're going, to give, we're going to value a lot on that. But what's happened over the last year is the market said, we don't no longer believe that you can make that, you can just turn turn off growth or turn off the spending on growth and have a bottom line that's uh, cash flow positive. So they want to see growth, but they want to see cash flow as well. And so what's happened since then Farmer's Edge um, did not only not continue to not continue not produce cash flow; they actually right. shrunk. So if you're being valued for growth and cash flow, and you're shrinking and you're burning lots of money, you're gonna get penalized. Mm -hmm. And Thinkific grew quickly; they grew eighty percent. But two things happened: they came out and said, "Hey, this year we'll probably go a bit slower at forty percent." And if you look at the growth, they grew eighty percent, but they had to you know increase losses from one million to you know. 1.3 million is roughly 26 million. So they had to probably spend for every dollar they grew. They, it looks like they basically had to spend it, lose a dollar. So that's no longer rewarded. A year ago, the market said, "Fine, eventually we'll turn this around. You're inve you're investing for the future." Right. Um, now we we want to see the investment in line with the growth. So that's a big difference. Right. Um, and last question: What does this mean for all the TechTO founders? Well, there's a few takeaways. First of all, you can't ignore the public markets. Um, the public markets valuation 
and values and the reason people invest privately depend on the eventual public market exit. And that happens one of two ways. Either you go public or you get acquired by a company that's public. That's how investors get their money back. That's how founders actually get can you know shared. You can say I'm worth a billion dollars in shares, but that doesn't pay for rent or oil or uh, your mm-hmm. new car. So the private markets eventually affect, sorry, the public markets eventually uh, affect the private markets. Second, um, you know, in a market like you've had over the last two years, you got rewarded just on growth. You didn't have to build a sustainable business. Um, I think as a, someone that talks with founders, I always say build a sustainable business, have a problem you can solve, know that when you solve that problem, there can be a gross margin and that you're getting rewarded for that. And there's bottom line. Um, in the last couple of years, if you could say, hey, you know, there might be a minuscule bottom line, we just have to get volume, you'll get rewarded. But now and always, it, you should be saying, is this, can I charge enough to make margin, you know, make money on my revenue and eventually mm-hmm. try to keep that, you know, fixed cost as low as possible? Um, so, what does this mean in practical terms? You're probably going to see lower valuations all across the board in the next 12 months. Uh, you'll see a, a gradual easing of the job market. Um, you know, when when companies realize they can't grow at all costs, they probably hire less. They're a bit more careful with hires. People get back on the job market. So the tightness and how hard it's been to uh, basically hire should probably slow down, not immediately, but next three to six months. And then employees should understand what's driving the growth of their business when it, before they join it and understand what the risk they are getting involved with. Just because a company's had easy raises, has a high valuation, you should understand if that's sustainable. Right. Uh, well, I appreciate your take and I always enjoy these. And if you like to hear more takes like this and want to find it all in one place, get it right to your inbox. You have to subscribe to the TechTO newsletter. If you haven't done so already, you can at techtoorg slash newsletter. We also have a link to subscribe um, and the link in our bio and all our social media. Uh, Alex, I always like to ask you, but what are you most looking forward to reading about on Friday? Well, I know we started doing flashback Fridays again. We mm-hmm. did this at the beginning of the newsletter, it went away, and now we're like highlighting wisdom and advice on our, that we have on a YouTube channel from the past. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing who we select for tomorrow's newsletter. Yeah, I know it's we have such great content hidden in the archives of TechTO, so it's always great to pull out a couple uh, great ones from the past and relive that again. It's awesome. Uh, okay, uh, moving on. So we talked about a pivot last week in quick takes, which means this probably means that there was some kind of transition for this company as well. So pivot to monetizing other people's content leads to a $14.5 million round for Bonsai. So what were they doing originally? And what are they doing now? How did they pivot? So Bonsai originally launched as a men's streetwear shopping and news app that allowed mm-hmm. consumers to buy items they saw in the content. It was designed to create a fun content shopping experience. Well, what Bonsai realized was, that, you know, they could keep the original vision of making it, of combining content and commerce to make a fun shopping experience and letting people, you know, curate articles and then allow people to buy it. But instead of fighting for the traffic, they could become a, what they call a commerce infrastructure company and enable people that already have the traffic and already creating the content to monetize their traffic. Uh, so that's basically what they do. They, they allow companies now to ena- you know, they ena- enable media companies to convert affiliate links into on-site cart and checkout experience. Mm-hmm. So if you see like a shoot an article, you can click on it and buy it. Um, this pivot happened because one of their partners actually said, hey, we'd love you to enable this for our site. Um, that was complex. And Bonsai now calls this their experience native commerce. That's awesome. So in your opinion, how has this pivot gone? Well, it seems to be going really well. Um, they partnered with many large media tech companies, including BuzzFeed, Vox, PureWow, Refinery29, and many others. Uh, the company claims to have a strong pipeline of media players. And the biggest, you know, I guess, bottleneck right now is they have to build out uh, a list of new merchants in new verticals. So they have the fashion merchants, um, but they need to go get like technology merchants. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, you can look at them, they have a, you know, a technology solution plus a marketplace. So it's a very interesting business model. Right. Uh, certainly. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the raise now? So the raise was led by Framework Venture Partners with participation from Lear, Lear Growth Partners, Marcus Fried, and others. They also range at $6.5 million in debt. So what's interesting here is Framework was spun out of BDC. Lira and uh, Marcus, uh, Marcus Fried are former entrepreneurs in, BC, in, in Vancouver. So 
this round was basically all in Canada, predominantly all in Canada round. You've got a cup, a family office and a high net worth individual that have made their money off tech uh, and understand retail. Uh, Marcus Friend was the founder of uh, Plenty of Fish. So oh, I guess cool. he, had, he had a different type of content that was shoppable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and lastly, what can uh, founders take away from this pivot and this experience? So, you know, pivots aren't always because a company's failing. Pivots mm-hmm. might be see, hey, you know, observing and seeing what's going on with your company. And I think this one, that's what Adapting. this Bonds, yeah, you know what happened here with Bonsai. They had a site which had a unique way to shop and they realized that underlying technology solved a problem for lots of media companies. Mm-hmm. And by providing that technology and a marketplace behind it, they could probably have a much bigger idea that was more cost effective and a bigger opportunity to solve. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, and as a perfect example where, and then this market change too, um, media companies or tech companies like BuzzFeed and Vox, if you go back five or six years ago, they were growing at all costs saying, hey, we're going to get all these eyeballs mm-hmm. and we're going to reinvent how you make a media company and be a huge venture scale outcomes. That didn't happen. So they actually had to go through a similar thing that we talked about in the previous um, quick take where they had to cut back their staff focus on more sustainable growth Mm -hmm. and they needed to find a way to make more money. Well, Bonsai's native commerce approach is a no brainer for them. They can focus on creating the content. They don't have to go get the advertisers. They can monetize. It probably converts at a higher, higher basis than what they were doing before making their content more more valuable. It's Mm -hmm. a better customer experience because it's not like, Hey, go click on these ads. It's like, Hey, you like this shop it right now. And they don't have to invest in the technology. So, um, Smart pivots don't have to happen because you're de- you know desperate, but come happens because you find a solution that's bigger for yours. Right. Um, you know, I, I think the big question now I have for Bonsai is how do they become ubiquitous? Does their marketplace have strong network effects? Because some marketplaces, like affiliate networks, which they're replacing, uh, were very popular, but didn't seem to have strong network effects, and so was not the ability to create like a venture scale outcome. Right. Uh, I like that because when you think pivot, you think something's just not working, but it's just about being adaptable. So I really like that. Thank you. Um, One segment that we're continuing uh, with on Quick Takes that I love is we're highlighting an insider company um, that we think that everybody should, you know, look up and care about. So we want to highlight Decklinks today. So Alex, can you tell um, us a little bit about what they do? I'm excited about this one. Uh, Decklinks is making B2B sales more human. They are creating personalized client portals where you can add video narrations and share engaging presentations with a single link. Whether you're sending sales presentations, sharing updates, or fundraising, DeckLinks empowers you and your team to deliver a more personal buying experience. Uh, if you want to find out more, you can visit their website at www.decklinks.com. And we'll also uh, link the website in the show notes as well so that people can go back and check them out. But definitely check out uh, DeckLinks. Sounds very interesting. Uh, so... I want to switch gears a little bit and go into Web3. Um, so the Web3 Council is formed uh, to shape Canada's approach to Web3. So first off, what is the Web3 Council? So Web3 had a launch, which maybe a launch announcement, which we could link into in our show notes. And mm-hmm. the Canadian Web3 Council is a nonprofit trade association formed to work constructively with policymakers and establish Canada as a leader in Web3 technology. And who are the members of this council? So the initial members, and this is, there's about 11 of them, um, you know, I can list them right now, are sort of the people you'd expect. There's AquaNow, Axio, Axiom Zen, which, and Dapper Labs. So Dapper Labs came out of Axiom Zen. Mm-hmm. Chain Safe Systems, uh, Ether Capital, ETH Global, Figment, Informal Systems, Linden, uh, Well Simple, and Wonderfy Technologies. Uh, so some of the more well-known names in the, the, in the Web3 community in Canada. Yeah, definitely. There's a few in there. Um, so why is this council formed? Well, you know, if you look at the Canadian regulatory and policy uh, mm-hmm. system, you have many different people that can imp- impact the growth of Web3. And what we don't have is a clear legal clarity or a unified policy, which makes it very difficult for startups or anyone to get involved with Web3. Because why? while founders are like risk takers they're you know viewed as risk takers they're really risk um mitigators right so they they take a business they make it less risky and when there's no clear legal policy legal uh framework or policy framework you're working a sort of gray area which you don't know what's going to happen so if you want to invest in you want Canada to become 
a leader in Web3, we need a bit more clarity and, uh, you know, so people can just go about their business and not have to worry about a big risk in what they're doing day to day. Right. Uh, and what have Canadians already done in Web3? So what's interesting is, and, the, and you can look at some of these people involved in this, Canadians have actually been leading in a few ways. Like we've, you know, we founded several notable blockchains, Ethereum, Cosmos, and Flow. Um, most people are probably very aware of Ethereum and, and Flow. Flow is the one. And we've actually, the Flow, which was created by Dapper Labs, which also launched CryptoKitties and NBA Top Shot, mm -hmm. um, also really, CryptoKitties is really the introduction or popularization of NFTs and NBA Top Shot with Flow is trying to make it, you know, made it more widely available. And also from a finance perspective, there was the first spot Bitcoin ETF that was publicly traded again. So we, we helped create lots of blockchains. We've helped make Web3 more accessible. So, right. you know, these are actually pretty leading innovations that have come out of Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I have to ask, what's the problem? And also, why should people care? Well, it, it, despite this innovation and leading approach, I, I would say Canada is not considered one of the leading places to start a Web3 company. And it's basically because of this lack of clarity and you know, compared to other jurisdictions which have either put out clear policies or clear regulations. So this is hold, we have the talent, we have the experience, we don't have the framework to actually be successful. Right. Okay. Well, um, thank you. I appreciate your take on that, Alex. Um, I want to move on to the quicker take uh, about Athenian's raise. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So Calgary-based Athenium raised $41.5 million after growing AR by 500% over the last two years. Um, just so you know what they do, because they're probably not a household name. Yep. They offer a cloud-based entity management platform, which is used primarily by uh, lawyers and professional service firms. So what that means is entity management is you think of a company name and a subsidiary, and there's a lot of work and paperwork and compliance around that that was historically done manually. So this simplifies, it puts in a cloud, creates workflows, makes digital signatures. So they've done really well. Right. Um, and why would our community and others find this news interesting? So the announcement reflects the recent trend of announcing fundraisers with larger numbers uh, that don't really reflect what I traditionally consider the amount raised. So if you break this raise down, the round was $27 million in primary capital, $5 million in secondary, $1.5 million in grants, and $8 million in debt. So... They, the headline number is 41.5, but I would argue the real number should be either 27 or 32 million, depending if you include primary and secondary. And mm -hmm. traditionally, this was not obfuscated or and it was pretty transparent what was raised. But I've seen over the last 12 months, it's I think this week, almost like half the announcements I raised, read, read and had some blurred number, which included debt. And you know, it goes to why are you telling people how much you raise? If it's a show that you're a healthy company or you're at VC interest, it should be, you should be transparent with what you've raised. So yeah. that's the first reason I found this interesting. Second thing is this is a huge win for the Calgary ecosystem. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's funny. If you talk to Albertans, they'll think the ecosystem's underperforming. And yeah. the weird thing is I think they're getting a disproportionate amount of large races compared to the companies they've got there. So you know, while they want to see more companies, it seems to be doing well. And and finally, uh, legal, the legal sector, which has, has been a laggard uh, adopter of technology, is mm -hmm. adopting it faster and faster. And you're still, I think we're going to see more and more legal tech financings in the near future. Right. Uh, definitely a huge win for the Calgary ecosystem. I definitely agree with you. Uh, what a week. Thank you, Alex, as always, for your takes on everything. I know uh, the community uh, as well as myself. Um, also, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe to TechTO wherever you are watching or listening and share your takes on uh, the week in Canadian tech with us. Uh, we'll be back next week for another edition of Quick Takes and we'll see you on the inside. We're in the business of delivering impossible things. We're in the business of delivering things that nobody's ever seen before. If you build that culture, you'll come up with you know really cool and innovative stuff and you know, literally could be in the next multi-billion dollar idea. So this conversation is largely going to be about scaling yourself and scaling your leadership team. I want to talk about one of the biggest struggles that I think a lot of startups face early on, which is building initial traction.